we're talking about consciousness, and, and just to begin, Philip Goff, could you say how you got interested in consciousness? And why is it, you know, it's become, obviously become a big thing in your life. You've just written a whole book about it. Yeah, I think I've been obsessed with the problem of consciousness as far back as I can remember, really. I think, I think what draws you in is, I think there's a kind of paradox about consciousness. On the one hand, consciousness is the thing that's most familiar. You know, nothing is more evident than the reality of one's own feelings and experiences. Uh, on the other hand, consciousness is the thing that's proven most difficult to integrate into our scientific story of the world. So, you know, despite rapid, in, lots of progress in our scientific understanding of the brain, we still don't have even the beginnings of an explanation of how complicated electrochemical signaling is somehow able to give rise to this inner subjective world of colours and sounds and smells and tastes that each of us knows in our own case. So this is the the so-called hard problem of consciousness. And, you know, so some people think that this is, you know, there is a deep problem here, but we just need to do more neuroscience and, and we'll eventually crack it. But I'm, I'm inclined to think the problem is deeper than that. And it, I, the core of the problem for me is that physical science works with a purely quantitative vocabulary, whereas consciousness is an essentially qualitative phenomenon, just in the sense that it that it involves qualities. If you think about the redness of a red experience or the smell of coffee or the taste of mint, and you can't capture these kind of qualities in, in the purely quantitative vocabulary of physical science. And so, so long as your description of the brain is framed in the purely quantitative vocabulary of neuroscience, you're always going to leave out these qualities and hence leave out, in my view, an, you know, an essential component of consciousness itself. It's so interesting because lots of neuroscientists think they're on the way to giving mm. an account of exactly the thing that you think cannot be accounted for by science. Yeah. I mean, how can you judge that? Yeah, so, I mean, neuroscience is absolutely crucial for a science of consciousness. You know, you're not going to make progress on consciousness without neuroscience. But... What neuroscience gives us, I believe, are correlations between activity in the brain and conscious experiences. So you can you know, scan someone's brain and you can ask them what they're feeling and experiencing and you can discover that you know, a certain kind of activity in the hypothalamus is, a comp is always accompanied by a feeling of hunger, you know, that the two always go together. And you know, neuroscience is develop this rich and very important body of correlations between brain activity and conscious experience. But that in itself is not a theory of consciousness. You know, what we ultimately want from a theory of consciousness is a, an explanation of those correlations. You know, why is it when you have this kind of activity in the hypothalamus, you have a feeling of hunger? And I think just doing more neuroscience, just gathering more correlations isn't going to answer that question. Thank you. Okay, so um, the other Philip. Uh, um, how did you get interested in consciousness? Uh, well, I, in a sense, I always have, because um, one of the first things I remember doing is looking at, you know, when you look at your finger and then you let your eyes drift by, you see two different images, each of which is transparent. That puzzled me for a very long time. Um, why am I seeing that? Uh, why does it look like that? Why does nobody talk about that? It's so interesting. Um, but the moment when I started actually working it out a bit more um, consistently than I was doing as a small child was when I first um, when I started writing my first novel, which was the day after I finished my final exams at Oxford, where I was studying English. Uh, you might think I'd come across this particular problem before in the um, essays I should have written and the lectures I should have gone to, but somehow it had passed me by. Anyway, I found myself um, faced with a problem that the filmmaker and playwright David Mamet has very well put in the question, which he says every film director has to answer, where do I put the camera? Where am I telling this story from? Where is this... I located, it's E-Y-E located, that's looking not into, not only at what the characters are doing, but into their minds and telling us what they're thinking. And then I began to wonder, well, hang on, I can't do this as a person. I can't describe 
um, the activities of any of you and then tell the reader what you're thinking, that's not possible for a human being. So whoever is doing this storytelling is not whatever else he or she is human. And over the 50 years since then, I've kind of um, anthropomorphized, if that's the right word, this strange floating consciousness um, into what I call a sprite. It's a sprite who tells the story. It's a sprite who is the camera, who can go anywhere, see anything, and so on. Um, this used to be called the position of the omniscient narrator. Um, and it used to be the, the, the one way we could tell a story. Um, once upon a time, there was a poor farmer who had two sons, for example. That's obviously something from a folktale. Uh, it's, a boy, it's an eye looking at it from the outside. Then, uh, we're in the sort of 18th century, 19th, early 19th century, when the modern novel first got going, um, the, 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 the telling voice began, began to do different things. Jane Austen, for example, began to float around between this character and that, telling us what she's thinking and then telling us what he's thinking. Uh, and that became the way of telling stories for quite a long time. But uh, that's the, the point where I came in and wondered what it was that was doing the seeing. So what kind of consciousness was this? It's interesting you chose a sprite rather than God. I mean, omniscience is usually the quality of a God. Ah, but the omniscient narrator never is omniscient uh, because he doesn't know everything. She doesn't know everything. They know a lot. The word really should have been multiscient. <laughs> uh, I... <laughs> Here's an example of the values of serendipity and the value of Chambers Dictionary. I wanted to, when I first used multiscient, I wanted to look it up to see if it had been defined anywhere, whether it's sort of official as a word you could use in Scrabble. And it does. But on the way to discovering, to, to discovering that and finding multiscient, I came across this definition in Chambers, mullet, a hairstyle that is short at the front, long at the back, and ridiculous all round. <laughs> Which is why I say Chambers is the one dictionary for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, so, I mean, so yeah, I think literature is all about consciousness in a sense, and the first-person perspective, and you know, part of what I try to do in my work is, you know, how do these worlds relate of the first-person perspective of consciousness that we we know probably best through literature? I think mm. actually probably you're better at communicating the reality of consciousness than I am. <laughs> But what I think of doing is, is how does that, that world of the first-person perspective relate, connect with the, with the third-person world of the, the information we learn from science about quantitative objective facts? How does all that fit together in a single unified worldview? Um, you know, and connecting with fiction, I mean, so, so one way of avoiding this is to say, maybe consciousness doesn't exist, right? This is, uh, and I wanted to ask you about this, actually, because... So, so, for example, philosophers like Daniel Dennett or Keith Frankish are, have argued in various moods that actually the, the brain tricks us. Consciousness is a kind of illusion. The brain tricks us into thinking we're conscious, but we're not really. It's just a sort of fiction. Um, and I've just finished The Secret Commonwealth, and I was intrigued by this. So I engage a lot with these philosophers, sometimes called illusionists, People who, that's a word that's called on people who think consciousness is just an illusion, a magic trick. Uh, but I was intrigued by this character, Simon Talbot, who, what is this sort of cold rationalist who Lyra's uh, enamored with for a while. And, um, and, and one of the things he defends is, is the startling thesis that maybe demons are an illusion, that they're a sort of psychological projection. With no, yeah. And I was, so I was curious to ask whether whether the, this character has any basis in these illusionist philosophers like Dan, Daniel Dennett or I don't know if there's any connection. Well, there may be points at which um, the one resembles the other, but I certainly wasn't modelling my character, Simon Talbot, on um, Dennett in particular. Um, there are two philosophers in the, in the, in the story yeah. um, who have slightly different takes on it, but neither of them believes in demons. Uh, just to explain for those who haven't read... Um, any of my books. The, the, the demon is an aspect of the character's personality or nature which has the form of an animal and it's sort of external. So um, we all go through life in Lyra's world accompanied by a demon who 
um, has the power to change shape when you're a child and then remains fixed when you're a grown-up. That's what the demon is. I've always found it a very good metaphor for all sorts of things, states of mind, um, alienation from yourself, for example, that, that kind of thing. But no, I wasn't modelling my philosopher on anyone in particular, partly because I find philosophy rather hard to read. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, philosophers don't do enough to reach out. I don't think so they, my, my method is to themselves. read like a butterfly and write like a bee. That's what I say. <laughs> very good, very good. Yeah. It's interesting what you were saying about the sprite, because the sprite is in a sense the storyteller in, in, yeah. in that model. Mm. Um, we were talking a bit earlier before we came on here about the role of narration in our self-understanding. Yeah. And that you know, consciousness is in part us telling ourselves, ourselves stories about mm. what's happening, what might happen, what has happened, how that all fits together. Yes, indeed. We're always doing that. Uh, the, the French phrase l'esprit d'escalier refers to the, <coughs> the, 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 the answer to a witty proposition or whatever it is that we think of on the way home and we should have thought of at the time. Uh, so we're always adjusting our stories of us, about ourselves and recasting what we've said and saying it better and, um, and, and so on. And we've come, I think, in, in recent years especially to mistrust memory in a way because it's been shown how people <clears throat> who claim that this has happened or that has happened, witnesses in court cases or whatever, must be mistaken because evidence goes the other way. Memory is a, uh, is, a, is a malleable thing, and um, I haven't written my memoirs yet, but when I do, I, I shall treat it exactly like a work of fiction, <laughs> in that I'll arrange it in such a way that it makes better sense as a story. Yeah. Might, not all, might not any of it be true, but no one will know, and it won't matter, because what I'm doing is making a story rather than giving evidence in a court case. I mean, that, those are the two examples of telling a story which are so different. If you're, if you're giving evidence in court as a witness, your duty is to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. But um, that sometimes makes a very poor story if you're writing something that you hope people will buy and read. <laughs> so well, we, we bi do this. Biographers don't tell the whole truth, even if they happen to have no, no. got access to amazing data. Yeah. They have to tell stories. You always have to decide mm. where to bring something in what to omit, Absolutely. how to link different parts of somebody's life together. It's not straightforward. You can't just begin a, on day one mm. and go on to the death. And different beyond. biographers tell different stories about the same subject. Absolutely. Mm. So, so even the apparently factual story where the facts aren't, con aren't, aren't controversial, you're putting, putting it in a form. You're, you're giving it a narrative arc. You're making sense yeah. of things in the light of what has happened and what might happen. I imagine it's some... Thing akin to what a painter might be doing, I mean a realist, a representative painter might be doing when they see a landscape. They're sort of moving that tree a bit to the left and then raising the mountains. You know, they're, they're adjusting in their medium, in, their, in the form they're at home in. They're adjusting what they see in terms of something that might be, look better, you know. They're, 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 they're adjusting things. Yeah, so, yeah, I mean, so I think there's a lot of truth in that, isn't it, that we are the stories we tell about ourselves. And, but I... I suppose, I suppose I think one can take that too far. Well, it depends what you're doing. I don't think you can take it too far if you're writing a novel, but in terms of thinking about what consciousness is and how it fits in, I mean, these illusionists we were just talking about say it's all a fiction, but I think there is an undeniable reality there, the reality of feeling pain, you know, the reality of feeling, you know, seeing red or feeling emotions... This is, this is a cold, hard reality. It's, it's, I agree with Descartes that it's, it, in, in one sense, the reality that, the, that we can't really deny, the only thing we can't really deny. And so we have to find some way of fitting it into our overall picture of the world. And that's, you know, that, that's the challenge, I think. To be fair to the people you're attacking, they're not gonna, then it's not going to deny that you feel pains, that they feel real to you. Um, Easily... In some colours, moods, yeah. it, well, Keith Frankish is, is, it comes cl mm. most explicit to saying no, the way, consciousness and the, mm. the way we ordinarily think about it just does not exist. And it's what, he's such a warm, empathetic character. He's a very good friend <laughs> of mine. And yet he thinks, in some sense, no one's ever felt pain. No one's ever... <laughs> but, uh, it, I mean, is this a position sense, of thinking... <laughs> does, this impish, uh, uh, does that way of thinking imply that other people must be zombies? 
Or might be zombies Dennett, or are yeah. zombies. Dennett has at what so this is the philosophical zombies are these imaginary creatures who behave just like us in all ways, but they have no consciousness. So you stick a knife in them, they scream and run away, but they don't actually feel pain. Or if they're crossing the road, they'll look both ways and wait for the traffic to stop, but they don't actually have any visual experience. They're just complicated mechanisms that are set up to behave as though they have experience when they don't really. So these are put to various philosophical aims. But Dennett, so you're saying, does he really mean this? Dennett is a direct quote from Dennett. He says, we are all zombies. So, you know, we think we have feelings and an inner life, subjective inner life, but this is just a trick, a clever it sounds trick. sounds not far off psychopathology. You know, there's a, um, I suppose the usual <laughs> definition of a psychopath is someone who has no empathy for other people, mm. who acts as if they don't have any feelings. Isn't... Isn't, doesn't the, the, the zombie idea lead to that yeah, or well, stem I, from that? It's a good question. How do people end up thinking these very strange things? So, I mean, what I'm keen to press is, I think one reason is people look to the great success of physical science in explaining more and more of our universe, and they think, you know, this has to be the complete story. It's really worked. It's really getting us somewhere. But what I try to press in my work is, Actually, the reason it's been so successful is because it was always aimed at a, a quite narrow, specific task from Galileo onwards of just cap constructing mathematical models to capture the, the behaviour of matter, the quantitative features of matter. And that's gone really well, and it's produced extraordinary technology. But it, you know, it, was, it was always aimed at a very limited task, and that's why it's been so successful. This is what I like so much about your book because it points to that moment when Galileo did decide that the things he would investigate are the things you could investigate by means of mathematics and other things he'd leave out. Yeah. Um, I find that a fascinating, uh, fascinating take on it. Yeah, so, so Galileo wanted the new science to be mathematical, to have a purely mathematical vocabulary. But actually, he well understood that you can't capture consciousness in these terms. Mm. Consciousness is an essentially qualitative phenomenon and you can't capture it in a purely quantitative language like mathematics so what he did was he said well if we want a mathematical science we have to take consciousness out of the domain of science yeah. once we've done that we can capture everything in in mathematics but the, so the difficulty the with that of course project was premised <laughs> so people say oh it's gone really well it, so it'll surely one day explain consciousness yeah. the irony is it's gone really well because it was designed to exclude consciousness That's yeah the, and the difficulty is you have the, the you know the mind body problem and are they separate things the dualism and all the rest of it the thing i like about panpsychism which is your um, field of expertise is that at a single stroke it seems to do what Copernicus and Kepler did with the Ptolemaic universe um, when we, before we had telescopes and before we knew very much about the physical world we'd see the planets going across the sky and imagine quite perfectly reasonably that they were going around the earth and the earth was the centre of everything um, as time went past and time went past and observations became more acute and more of them came in, it began to the people began to notice that they weren't going regularly. Some of them would sort of stop and go slower or speed up a bit. Uh, and they had to find an explanation for this, so they thought of the epicycles, which were little loops on the big circles were, that they describe when they're going around the Earth. Uh, and eventually uh, more and more observations came in and even that wasn't sufficient so they had epicycles on epicycles and it became tremendously complex which is the state of things that I think we have with consciousness and um, physical science. The, the, the explanations get more and more complicated and more and more unreasonable. With one stroke, panpsychism does away with it. It banishes the epicycles and um, explains what, a lot so, so much about consciousness. It was like, for me, it was like the sun coming out. OK, I saw a few puzzled faces at the word panpsychism. So maybe you could gloss panpsychism. And you did mention earlier, you know, you're curious about how, how some people came to believe such exotic things as that consciousness doesn't exist. But it seems pretty <laughs> exotic to me um, to believe in panpsychism, which you're going to gloss now. Yeah. Like, so, well, maybe I could just build up to the, the, the kind of panpsychism I defend. So it's, it's rooted in very important work from the 1920s by the philosopher Bertrand Russell and the 
scientist Arthur Eddington, who is incidentally the first scientist to confirm Einstein's theory of general relativity. Um, but I'm inclined to think these guys did in the 1920s for the science of consciousness what Darwin did in the 19th century for the science of life. And it's a tragedy of history that it, it was forgotten about for so long, but it's recently been rediscovered in academic philosophy and is causing a great deal of excitement. And part of the reason I wrote this book was to try and get these ideas out to a broader audience. But anyway, so the core of the idea, Russell and Eddington's starting point was that, and I want to connect this to Philip's work actually, um, is that physical science actually doesn't really tell us what matter is. Mm. And that seems a kind of bizarre claim. You know, you read a physics textbook, you seem to be learning all this incredible stuff about the nature of space and time and matter. But what Russell and Eddington realised is that physical science, despite its richness, is confined to telling us about the behaviour of matter, about what it does. Mm. You know, physical science tells us matter has mass and charge, and these things are characterised entirely in terms of behaviour. You know, charge is a matter of attraction and repulsion. Mass is defined in terms of gravitational attraction and resistance to acceleration. This is all about behaviour. Physical science tells us absolutely nothing about what philosophers like to call the intrinsic nature of matter, how matter is in and of itself. So it turns out actually there's this huge hole in our scientific story of the world. The proposal of Russell and Eddington is to put consciousness in that hole, right? So, you know, we're looking for a place for consciousness in our scientific story. We're not sympathetic to dualism, which we should briefly touch on. We're looking for a place for consciousness. We've got this hole. Why not stick consciousness in the hole? So the result is a kind of panpsychism, which is the ancient view that consciousness is a fundamental and ubiquitous feature of reality. But this is a kind of panpsychism that's stripped of any mystical connotations, or at least could be. Uh, so the view is, there's just matter, fields, particles, nothing supernatural, nothing spiritual necessarily, but matter can be described from two perspectives. Physical science describes it, as it were, from the outside in terms of its behaviour, but matter from the inside in terms of its intrinsic nature is constituted of forms of consciousness. So this is a beautifully simple, elegant way of integrating consciousness into our scientific story of the world. And that's really yeah. the attraction. I mean, if I could just, just say a short thing. Sorry, that was a bit of long-winded. But I discovered an intriguing connection to Philip. So I'm a huge fan of Philip's work, but I didn't realise there was a connection with my own work until we hooked up on Twitter, of all things, and um, emailed a little bit. And then I looked back at his dark materials, and I found this fantastic line from The Subtle Knife, which actually perfectly captures, I think, um, the view I've just been describing. So, so this is a conversation with the scientist Mary talking Hello. to dust particles, or shadows, as she calls them, I think, if I remember right. And she asks them, are, are you what we have called spirit? And the particles reply, is, I won't go into how they're communicating, but anyway, they're not <laughs> actually speaking. And they reply, from what we are, spirit, from what we do, matter, matter and spirit are one. And I think, you know, that perfectly captures, funnily enough, you know, the view I've been describing. So, yeah. Well, I'm very flattered to, to, uh, to hear you say that. Um, I've been, the, the story of his dark materials is in part an investigation uh, by me of this whole problem of the, the nature of us, the nature of what we are, how we come to perceive things. And a lot of exciting things were going on then when I was writing it oh, 25 years ago. Um, w one of them was the nature of dark matter, this mysterious thing in the universe which must exist for galaxies to behave gravitationally in the way that they do, but nobody knows what it is. And I was praying all the way through. Praying to whom? I don't know. <laughs> Hoping all the way through. But they wouldn't discover what it was before I finished the book. <laughs> And they haven't yet, so I've been lucky so far. Um, but it seemed to me, as I was developing the world of this, of this book, and I say developing and not creating, because it, it, it feels like unfolding something that's, that's already there, or discovering something that's already there. And this is one of the mysterious things about um, creativity, I suppose. 
It really does feel like discovery and not invention, as if it's there in some way before. Anyway, um, in this world, there, there, there's a, um, an entity which they call dust, with a capital D. And it seems to have various properties which uh, some people are investigating in the world, other people um, fear because it seems to deny what their holy book tells them. Um, and uh, it, I thought of it as... I thought of it as... as, as rather like dark matter or something we don't know yet but we know is there. Uh, there must be a field, and the, the Higgs boson, the Higgs field came into it as well, giving me another metaphor. Now, I don't want to say the function of the physical sciences is the production of metaphors for subsequent development in the arts, <laughs> but I can't deny they're very useful. And the, the Higgs boson, which was d discovered recently, um, is the particle which is associated with a field which is what gives mass to things. We, have, we talk about the mass of things because they are, this mass is conveyed in some way, which I don't understand, um, by the Higgs boson, which is an expression of the, the Higgs field. I think of dust in the same way, but with regard to consciousness. I have a scientist called Rusakov, who discovers this Rusakov field, which permeates everything, and the particle associated with this is my dust. And it has something to do with consciousness. So um, I don't know exactly what it is yet, because I haven't read the last part of the last book. Um, but I will, and I will continue my investigations. That's a, that's my my picture of it, anyway. See, this is fascinating, and it, it's you know obviously you've got an amazing imagination, but he believes this stuff almost. And so that's <laughs> quite different. <laughs> <laughs> Well, do you? I'm, I'm actually curious how sympathetic you are to... I mean, I, I, I get the feeling you are a little bit sympathetic. I, I love the way, you know, in relation to our book, you described it as this sort of new Copernican revolution. I mean, that's just the skill of a novelist, that wonderfully poetic way of putting it. And that really captures, for me, the appeal of it. You know, when I was a philosophy undergraduate in the dying embers of the 20th century, you, we were taught there were only two options on consciousness, right? Mm. Either you were... A materialist, and you thought consciousness could be explained away in terms of the chemistry of the brain, or was an illusion of some kind even, or you were a dualist, the view that consciousness is non-physical outside mm. of the workings of the body and brain. And I came to feel that you know, both of these views were pretty hopeless for various reasons. And so I actually left philosophy and thought, I wrote my end of year, my end of degree dissertation saying the problem of consciousness is irresolvable, you know, and went off and did something else and tried to forget it. Uh, and then, but then it was discovering this middle way that sounds kind of wacky, but, you know, is there avoids an analogy, the deep difficulties with these two, these two is problems. Is there an, any sort of analogy, do you think, between the contradiction between Newtonian physics and quantum physics? Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, uh, Einstein developing Newton describes the cosmic in terms of space-time, gravitation and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, but... For some reason, which I have never understood, this isn't compatible in some strange way with quantum, with quantum mechanics. mechanics. Mm -hmm. um, so they're both true, but they're true on different yeah. scales. Yeah. Could the two views that you just described both be true but on different scales or different dimensions? Yeah, that's a really nice way of putting it. In, in a way, we've got these two things that we know are real. You know, Our own experience obviously has to be real, but also the rich information, the objective information we have from physical science, but they, mm. don't, you know, they don't seem to fit together. And, yeah. and, and, I mean, I think... I mean, some people just think, oh, we just need to do more, more science, you know. We'll... But I think often that's a very simplistic view of science, as though it's just doing the experiment and getting the data. Mm. But actually, you know, some of our biggest leaps in science have involved reimagining the universe, yeah. you know, rethinking, you know, Einstein developing special relativity wasn't so much doing experiments. He was sitting wondering what it would be like to ride on a beam of light and what yeah. would follow. And re that, that wonderful reimagining from thinking of space and time as different things as we always had, mm -hmm. to thinking of there just being one fundamental thing, space time. And there are all sorts of radical reimaginings from an armchair. And so my hunch is, you know, to make progress on consciousness is not going to is not only going to involve experimental data, but reimagining the universe. Mm. And this seem, this panpsychist this specific panpsychist framework seems to me a way of doing that in a way of well, moving, you, you know. do that in the book. Actually, one of the delightful bits of the book for me was where you start to imagine what it would be like to be a, 
a panpsychist in relation to uh, ethics, in relation to the environment, how we think about trees, if they could be conscious at some level, how we think about other people. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so I always want to emphasise I'm, I'm not a novelist, I'm a philosopher, and, you know, I think as scientists or philosophers, we should be thinking not about the view we'd like to be true, but the view that's most <laughs> likely to be true. But I, I, I do think a case can be made that there's a strong case for the probable truth of panpsychism as the best explanation we have of how consciousness fits in to yeah. our scientific story. But I also think it, it is a picture of the world that's maybe slightly more consonant with our mental and spiritual well-being. You know, the, the materialist view is kind of pretty bleak. You've just got a kind of mechanistic, essentially mechanistic view of nature and then the cold immensity of empty space. Whereas, you know, on the panpsychist worldview, we're conscious creatures in a conscious universe. This is a worldview in which we can perhaps feel a little bit more comf at home, a little bit more comfortable in our own skin. Well, this uh, is, uh, I completely agree with that. And I think it's a very true, a very true observation. Um, I, I come to it uh, also through poetry. Um, William Blake is my guiding star in many things. Uh, and I like to quote Blake whenever the chance arises. Um, at one point he says, what, how do you know but every bird that cuts the airy way is an immense world of delight closed to your senses five. And elsewhere he talks about a world where every particle of dust breathes forth its joy. He was uh, clearly very sympathetic to the idea that matter itself, the, the stuff we can feel and see around us, is conscious in some strange way. Um, and uh, so before Bertrand Russell and Eddington, uh, William Blake was right. on the same track, I think. Right. It's not necessarily comforting. Like, you know, there are a couple hundred people looking at us. That's slightly unnerving. What if the bookcases and the water's looking at me, <laughs> thinking about me? Uh, everything's looking at me. You know, it, it doesn't, if I'm a bit yeah. neurotic, it could really well, turn me I over mean, the edge. Well, I mean, it might be in one common misapprehension. I mean, it, so the panpsychists needn't necessarily think absolutely everything is conscious. That, I mean, the view is the minimum. The basis of the view is that the the basic constituents of reality, maybe electrons and quarks, maybe fields have some kind of unimaginably simple experience. So it's not like the electrons sitting there feeling existential angst or something. You, know, it's, you only get the kind of rich human... The French electrons do that. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you, you only get rich human experience after millions of years of evolution. Yeah. But, uh, and it, but that doesn't, so the basic constituents are conscious, but it doesn't mean every combination of particles is conscious. It doesn't mean the table is conscious, for example, but, yeah. Well, it does we mean it's made... conscious at some Sorry. level, doesn't it? The things that make it up are conscious, but maybe the, the table as a oh. whole does not necessarily have yeah. its own distinctive form of experience. Uh, the fundamental particles have mass, but a very little mass. Yeah. We haven't mentioned the emergence. What do you mm. think of the idea that um, consciousness is a property that emerges with increasing complexity? Mm. Um, you know, so whereas the electrons and even the molecules and so on that constitute my brain don't have very much consciousness mm. themselves when they're all tangled together and talking to each other consciousness emerges from that does that make any sense yeah i think in so, well so that's something or is, it, is it contradicted already i think the problem well, it's a nice story but you know how does it happen it, it often thinks people use emergence as a sort of another word for a miracle happens at some point. I mean, I suppose my, my core problem with that, going back to where we started, is physical science that works with a purely quantitative description of what's going yeah. on in the brain, whereas consciousness is an essentially quality-involving phenomenon. How do you bridge that gap between the purely quantitative mm. and the qualitative? Yeah. You know, no one's ever made the slightest progress in my view in, in making sense of that so when people talk about emergence i'd want to know how are you bridging that gap between the qualitative sorry the quantitative and the qualitative yeah. that's that's to me is the core of the challenge i saw a very good example of emergence being a, um, a, a, a something that you hadn't expected coming together from a lot of simple right. things in the yeah. um, modern art museum in oxford a few years ago they had an exhibition of sculpture by sol lewitt who makes sculptures out of um, square white painted rods put together in cubes and then accumulated. And what you saw when you walked around this big mass of stuck together white hollow cubes were all sorts of unexpected things as you looked through them. From one angle you saw an equilateral triangle. Where did that come from? 
um, the only angles he put into it were 90 degree angles, not other angles. Um, that's the kind, that was a picture for me of emergence that I hadn't seen before. Yeah. Something unexpected emerging from simple on, things. On the topic of emergence, so I guess, although I'm a panpsychist and I think in some way experience is there all the way down, but only very simple forms, I do think human experience, distinctively human traits are emergent. Mm. They evolve from millions of years. Whereas, I'm curious to know, I mean, dust, as you describe it, is actually associated with something quite specifically human, loss of innocence or self-consciousness. Yeah. So are you maybe sympathetic to the view that something distinctively human is kind of fundamental to the universe? or Not to the universe. That couldn't be possible if we believe that the universe sort of jumped into being with the Big Bang 14 billion years ago, whatever it was. Um, but yes, I do think there's something distinctive about human beings, which is our, which is our power to, uh, our ability to reflect on our own experience. Mm. Um, you know, whether, if I believe that glass of water is conscious, well, maybe it is, but it's not doing much reflecting, as far yeah. as we know. <laughs> maybe it's in conversation with your glass, and they're saying, hey, <laughs> cook it with me, then you, look, he's not going to put that back away. Um, <laughs> But, uh, yes, in the story that I've written, clearly um, human self-consciousness, human awareness came into being um, 30, 40,000 years ago, something like that. And it's based, of course, on the, um, the coming of artistic, you know, little remains of art, cave paintings, little carvings on stones, that sort of thing. That seems to be a time when people were becoming interested in other things than where the next meal was. So, yeah, I, did, I do think you, this, the sort of consciousness that we're displaying now, and um, we display every day, did kind of emerge from something that was less conscious. That's, that's still a problem it's, for a panpsychist, isn't it? You've got lots of little mm. bits of vaguely conscious stuff, and then suddenly you've got this thing that can reflect on yeah. what matter is and whether it's conscious Well, maybe or not suddenly, you see. Yeah. Maybe well, gradually, emotion, but gradually. It's, still, it's the same yeah. kind of yeah. difficulty that a materialist has I mean, in the, a way. It's just sure. expressed in different a terms. So. A lot of people press that and try and say, that, you know, there's no progress here at all. I yeah. mean, okay, I'll press that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, look, all of these views have problems, and that there's you no, know, it's early days in my view in a science of consciousness. Uh, but it just, I suppose, it seems to me that the challenges facing a panpsychist research program look to be more tractable than the problems facing, say, materialists. You know, the, at the core mm. of materialism, as I've already laboured, you've got this huge explanatory gap between the purely yeah. quantitative yeah. objective properties and the qualitative subjective. And, you know, I don't think you've made any progress. Whereas the, the explanatory gap for the panpsychist is how do you get from very simple forms of consciousness to very complex forms yeah. of consciousness? That seems to me... And in no, no one quite has a fully satisfactory account. There are already very intriguing proposals, but it seems to be something we can make progress on. And you know, it just makes more sense to me. Yeah. Do you think it's true? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> can we just show warm appreciation for a, a brilliant discussion between the Thank two, Philip?